the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court has partially upheld a consolidated appeal challenging the constitutionality of the Finance Act 2023. The seven judges of the Apex Court, led by Chief Justice Martha Kome, declared several sections of the Act unconstitutional, emphasizing the need for adherence to legislative processes and public participation requirements. This decision, following a lengthy legal battle over the government's appeal regarding the Act's legality, uh, sets forth crucial recommendations aimed at enhancing transparency and accountability. The Supreme Court delivered a landmark judgment on the Controversial Finance Act 2023, addressing the government's appeal regarding its legality. While the court upheld parts of the law, it also emphasized the need for improved public participation in the legislative process, setting forth crucial recommendations aimed at enhancing transparency and accountability. In the ruling, the Supreme Court overruled the Court of Appeals' declaration that the entire Finance Act 2023 was unconstitutional. However, the seven judges of the Apex Court, led by Chief Justice Mother Kaome, did uphold significant findings, declaring Section 76 and 78 related to the Kenya Roads Act and Section 87 concerning the Unclaimed Financial Assets Act as unconstitutional. The Court's decision highlights the importance of legislative compliance particularly regarding the provisions of a money bill. Notably, the court deemed the issue surrounding the affordable housing levy debatable, thereby avoiding further controversy on that front. The Supreme Court further urged Parliament to establish a statutory framework for public participation and ensuring that every version of a bill remains accessible to the public throughout the legislative process. The court also stressed that reasonable measures must be in place for considering public input reinforcing the necessity of transparency and accountability in lawmaking. Thank you, Ben Chumba, for that report. Now, learning in public universities has been paralyzed yet again after lecturers resumed their nationwide strike on Tuesday, accusing the government of failing to implement the return to work formula they signed last month. Speaking at Technical University of Kenya in Nairobi, University Academic Staff Union Uwasu Secretary General, that is Konstantin Wesonga, uh, vowed that the strike will only end if lecturers receive the 7 to 10 percent salary increment agreed in the 2021-25 collective bargaining agreement. Joseph Okongo with the details. With just one month gone since they ended their two-week strike in September, university dons in the country Tuesday boycotted teaching in a bid to push the government to implement a 10% salary hike it had offered them as part of a deal that ended their strike. From Pwani to Rongo University, from Rongo to Turukana, from Turukana to Meru, it is 100% shutdown. And I want to thank Lons for heeding the call of the union. According to University Academic Staff Union Secretary General Constantin Wanga, the Interpublic Universities Council Consultative Forum has blocked an automatic 4% annual increment on lecturers' basic salary. He recalled that the lecturers had initially sought the full implementation of the CBA but ultimately agreed to a compromise that included a 7 to 10 percent salary increase and an annual 4 percent increment. In our last meeting, the Vice Chancellor's Committee, Professor Mugendi, said that 4 percent has not been paid anywhere in the world. From that day, we have been doing research, and today I have data that there are cadre in the civil service that are paid even 8% automatic annual increment. The lecturers have accused the government of resorting to threats and intimidation instead of forestalling effects of their strike, which will include delays in administration of exams in universities. You cannot joke with the people who have gone to school. No lecturers have gone, have gone to school. You can't cheat them. Go and teach them now. Hey, we have refused to go to class. Go and teach them. Go. That you are scaring us with the sucking. <laughs> Dons can teach anywhere in the world. Don't scare us. The strike commenced on Tuesday after the expiration of a seven-day notice issued to the government by the Uaso National Executive Council. matters education president william ruto now says 
10 million school-going children um, in Kenya will receive a healthy uh, meal, uh, a healthy meal and nutritious meal in, uh, in school by 2030. The president who spoke during a ministerial meeting on global school meal coalition uh, said providing meals in schools will dignify our children, increase enrollment and enhance attendance and boost performance. Let's get the details of that with Give Us On Minor. Speaking during a second ministerial meeting on the Global School Meals Coalition with stakeholders and partners, the president said the current school feeding program benefits 2.6 million children. Initially, the program was implemented only in Nairobi. However, the entry of the World Food Program transformed us and expanded scale nationally. The outcome has been inspiring. It is undeniable that Kenya has recorded exemplary rates of enrollment retention. This marking an increase from 240,000 learners in 2009. The government now targets 10 million learners by 2030. Today, Your Excellency, Kenya proudly reaffirms its commitment to the Global School Meals Coalition and Kenya's goals, including the scale-up plan for universal coverage the head of state, however, regretted that despite the intervention, hunger still poses a significant challenge to school-going children across the country, hence the need to boost budgetary allocations. We still have too many children out of school, and it is the reason why I specifically asked the governor of Nairobi that we cannot have the capital city of Kenya with too many children out of school, largely because of two things, infrastructure in our schools, and secondly, hunger. It is estimated that in areas of conflict in Africa, there are close to 100 million children out of school. Everyone is asking, what do we do about Africa's young people? The first thing, obviously, is to secure their future through education, through keeping them in school, through feeding them. And that is why we see this as an African solution to a global concern. We will be allocating, still uh, later this year, 5.5 million euros to WFP's school meals program globally with a special emphasis on African countries, Burundi, Kenya, Liberia and Zambia, as well as also in Yemen, Syria and Myanmar. The Global School Meal Coalition comprises of 130 partners and 105 countries committed to scaling up school meal programs across the world. Thank you, Give Us Some Minor, for that report. Now, the Federation of Women Lawyers has called for urgent action from authorities following the recent spate of femicide cases in the country. According to FIDA, since January this year, 30 women have died in the hands of their intimate partners, but the crimes have been treated casually. The Federation wants President William Ruto to now declare femicide a national crisis. Early this year, women rights activists took to the streets to condemn increasing cases of femicide in the country. A few months later, that scenario may repeat itself. The Federation of Women Lawyers Kenya has yet again raised an alarm of increasing cases of the murders. The media has reported and highlighted the murders of at least six women whose bodies were dumped in Kware and Bakasi, shocking the entire country as well as the world. The main suspect in these horrific murders, Collins Jumaisi, escaped from Gigiri police station, and to date, his whereabouts are unknown. Yesterday, the country woke up to the utter shock of the media reports that the body of Yvonne Jirangwa, a 23-year-old trainee Catholic nun, was found in a sewer pit within Rongo Parish convent. FIDA, joined by a host of human rights activists, accuses security organs of laxity in conducting investigations and bringing the perpetrators to book. In 2024, so far FIDA Kenya is aware of at least 30 cases of in the hands of intimate partners as a result of domestic violence and femicide. These cases have been reported to the National Police Service, but unfortunately the pace of investigations is excruciatingly slow. We can no longer afford to treat femicide as an isolated series of incidents.
It is a national emergency that requires urgent and coordinated responses from the highest offices in the land. In their quest for urgent action, FIDA has built out a raft of measures which should be implemented, including legislative reforms to have femicide treated as a standalone crime. The president should officially declare femicide a national crisis and a disaster. The Directorate of Criminal Investigations, DCI, and the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, that is the ODPP, must provide a detailed public update on the status of investigations and prosecutions of all suspects tied to these femicide cases. The Federation says while it is conducting sensitization, the effort needs to be supplemented by government. Should there be no action within the next 30 days, we will consider other options, including mobilizing a nationwide picketing of women to demand our right to safety and justice. We cannot allow femicide to become a normalized part of, of a society. Enough is enough. Now, members of parliament want the Kenya Rural Roads Authority, Kara to provide details of how and why the agency was fined 16 million shillings for breaching a contract with Total Security Firm. Kara Director General Philomen, uh, Philomen Kandie was unable to explain to the National Assembly's Public Investment Committee on Energy and Commercial Services what caused the breach of contract that led to taxpayers losing at least 16 million shillings. The Kenya Rural Roads Authority had contracted Total Security Firm to provide security at its 47 regions regional offices and headquarters for a period of two years at a cost of 29 million shillings but ended up paying 45 million shillings after arbitration. The basis of payment of Kenya shillings 45 million 457 and 960 was as a result of the arbitration award. Uh, who advised for some uh, payments to be made. Like this interest, interest of 16 million. Ah, what was that for? The, this is the elephant in the, the elephant in meat. Somebody tried to be very smart to mint money from uh, the, the coffers, public coffers. So, because how do uh, Star Security just move to arbitration without a legal, the legal department doing something about it. The contract had an arbitration clause. So when the payment was not made, arbitration proceedings were undertaken, where we participated and raised a defense on behalf of the organization. You have been having obligation with contractors whom we have not paid for a very long time with a lot of pending bills. Have they taken to an arbitrator? Total security is one of the security firms that we offered to give us security in our offices. Where? Now, the details of the offices, I may not know it offered, but I can give you that list. Kara, you are going with the, what people say in English, an egg on the face. I don't know what it means, but uh, you can see yourself. You cannot know the date upon which the contract was entered into, the, what, what they breached that led to that, what happened and what happened, how many, which region are they supposed to take care of, how many security officers were to give you, uh, so you know all those things. Now, First Lady Rachel Ruto is calling on the Mac Foundation to consider extending their more than a mother campaign to include specific programs focused on child health education, particularly in the area of school feeding. Now, the First Lady spoke on Tuesday during the 11th edition of the Mac Foundation Africa Asia Luminary in Tanzania, where she acknowledged the foundation's uh, scholarship for over uh, 210 doctors in Kenya in underserved medical specialities. The 11th edition of the forum brings together African first ladies from 18 countries to discuss strategies and impacts of partnership programs in building healthcare capacity, breaking infertility stigma, and supporting the girl child education. Plus in our economic blueprint, known as the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. Despite education being a fundamental human right, 
countless children remain locked out of learning opportunities due to poverty, conflict, and other barriers. Now, gender-based quotas should be established for engineering jobs as well as inclusive hiring practices to benefit women. The president's advisor on women's rights, Harriet Shigai, is urging women engineers to leverage technology to boost their competitiveness in the male-dominated profession. In pay, family, and cultural stereotypes have been blamed for the gap between male and female engineers in Kenya with women accounting for only 13% of all registered engineers. With more support, when we continue to support one another, we shall be able to have more of us, uh, you know, being leaders, particularly in engineering. The excellent education that we have received in this country, and I trust that this convention will actually pass to this conviction. The president's advisor on women's rights, Harriet Chigai, believes this could be addressed through deliberate measures favoring women engineers such as flexible work environments, support systems, and safe, inclusive workplaces. When you are in position of responsibility and authority, then you cover up and you, you, you advise the organization when it comes to uh, policies that support women to work and grow in our organization. They also want initiatives encouraging girls to embrace science, technology, engineering and mathematics courses as early as in primary school to build interest. The government through relevant ministry, ministries has undertaken initiatives aiming at inspiring young girls to pursue STEM careers such as the STEM camps, workshops, competitions to encourage more women to enter these fields. They were speaking during the official opening of the 31st IEK International Convention in Mombasa. We actually mentor the young engineers. We are not just there for them to see the role models, but we also mentor them, we encourage them, and when they have issues, at least now they see the people that they can come and talk to. That was not there earlier, because if I see the people who are older than me, they are actually older engineers than me, they are actually very few. I'm Regina Manyara reporting for KBC Channel 1 from Shanzu, Mombasa County. Thank you, Regina, for that report. We look at business, where a delegation from the federal state of the Bavaria, led by Economic Affairs Vi Vice Minister, that is Tobias Godat, are in Kenya scouting for business opportunities. Trade Cabinet Secretary Salim Vuria says Kenya is keen on deepening bilateral ties with the federal state of Bavaria in commerce, labor, agriculture, and innovation. Vuria says the partnership will also focus on scaling up technical training, investing in special economic zones and industrial parks, as well as promoting entrepreneurship in Kenya. We was focusing more on how the Bavarian state, which is the 16th largest uh, state, uh, and it is also a big economy in uh, Germany, uh, on how we can leverage uh, on the opportunities that we already have with the Federal Republic of Germany uh, in terms of the bilateral relations, uh, leveraging also on the uh, economic partnership uh, agreement we have with the EU uh, to see how we can mobilize investments uh, from the state of uh, Bavaria. Uh, already the German and Kenya have a good export market. We export agricultural products uh, to Germany every year. And uh, in 2023, for example, we exported, uh, uh, our exports value were around 16 billion, uh, mostly uh, agricultural products, uh, coffee, tea, uh, flowers, and also uh, macadamia and other agricultural products. Uh, at the same time, we imported products from Germany to the tune of 39 billion, uh, 39 billion uh, which means then the balance of trade is currently in favor of Germany. Uh, and utilization of uh, these meetings and also uh, opening up the market. We had a very uh, friendly and positive and inspiring meeting uh, um, this morning. Uh, I can say that uh, for Bavaria as a part of Germany um, and the economically strongest region uh, in Germany, 
Um, Kenya is uh, our strongest partner on the African, con uh, African continent, and we are really looking forward to deepen uh, the cooperation. Micro, small and medium-sized enterprises in Kenya should expand their markets to tap the 300 million East African community market. Speaking during the Kenya Day at the ongoing EAC SME Trade Fair in Juba, MSME uh, Development Cabinet Secretary, that is Weekly for Pan, said the East African community market remains largely untapped by Kenyan businesses. unless we continue to work together so that we can aggregate our products better, produce our products more cost effectively, so that as the government handles the policy issues that are hampering or hindering our participation at the regional market, to clear to make banga vizuri. We must work together, we must improve on our products, and the government, and especially through the authority, will support you to ensure that your products are better and better. MSMEs are very important drivers of economic growth and development in East Africa, accounting for over 90% of the total employment in the region and 30% of exports. In addition, these enterprises currently constitute over 90% of all businesses and contribute 29% of the GDP of the East African region market, which has 312 million people. In these people lies the big opportunity of reaching out to the um, African continental free trade area. We have uh, an opportunity to improve the quality of our products so that by and by, uh, our Minister, we want to encourage these people to remove their competition from between themselves to competing with other big players like, like uh, uh, Singapore, like Malaysia, like Taiwan, like China, India, uh, so that even when whatever we are exhibiting here, our Minister, should be product that can meet the international market standards. We want to have agenda focusing on MSME. Why that is very important? It's very important because if we, Kenya, we have prioritized MSME, and let's say other member states, our, may, our neighbors also prioritize MSME, when we come up with specific intervention that are targeting to grow this sector, we will be reading from the same script. So that all those issues that we are facing, a few challenges I know which are there, or when you're crossing the borders, or probably double taxation, either from here to Kenya, or non-tariffs, or all those issues. All of us, we will have similar conscience around MSME. So when we start proposing our regulatory framework, it will be frameworks that promote conducive environment for the growth and development of our MSME. In sports, it's a new dawn for the Kenya Volleyball Federation who have now embraced innovation and digitization with the 2024-25 National Volleyball League scheduled to start on Thursday with exciting matches lined up in Nyeri. <laughs> 